Well, this morning, it's monumental. We're going to close up the first chapter of Peter. Uh, some people celebrate a whole book, but we kind of celebrate chapters here. It's, it's been really a rich time in the Word of God. And honestly, when I started Peter, my goal was to finish it by the time I went on vacation, which is next week. So I missed my goal greatly. But I got lost in what the angels have, epithumias, the, these over-desires to just look into the gospel of grace. They, they can't understand it. They can't comprehend it. They just long to say, this is unbelievable, the gospel of grace. And so I apologize it's taken so long, but not really. Last week, or two weeks ago, we began looking at verse 22. So if you'll turn to 1 Peter 1, I just want to begin reading then in verse 22. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but, but imperishable, and that is through the living and enduring Word of God, for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the Word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the Word which was preached to you. And so last time we began looking, there's only one command in this section once again with phrases and participles modifying it, but the command is to fervently love one another from the heart. And so the depth and the richness of this command should be the focus and study and the practice of our lives until it climaxes and reaches its fullness and glory for all of eternity. That's what's going to happen in heaven. An eternity that will be an eternity of perfect love, love to God, love to each other. It will last forever. And so my desire is that we show the world heaven on earth by our redemption manifested in a love like no other here at Southside Bible Church. And so that's where we've been journeying. That's where we've been praying. And I would like to go before the Lord and ask him to do what no human can do. Father, we come before you, and I thank you for these verses that are before us. I thank you for the depth of them, and I thank you that we'll never be able to plumb the line of them. But I pray that just in principle and truth, by your Spirit, you would help us to understand them this morning, that you would take this beautiful word that you inspired, and that even now you would illuminate it to every mind and heart. God, I pray that we don't just understand this academically. I pray that your Spirit now would help us to see the height and the depth and the breadth and the length of the love that you have for us in Christ Jesus. And I pray that we will see it in such a way that it will now flow by the Spirit of God through us into every life that we come in contact. I pray that all men would know we are your disciples because we have love for one another. God, continue to deepen and to grow our love for you and our love for each other. Grow our love for the lost. God, we desire that you would do this in our midst. So we turn our eyes now to your word and your word alone. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. I just want to review because uh, I like to review. <clears throat> when we were enabled, the question I asked two weeks ago, when were we enabled to love like this command? Because the last time we were together, we, we spent a season seeing that unbelievers cannot love with agape. Unbelievers can only love with a natural love. They can love with self as a center reference point. So even when they try to love, it's always geared towards their self. It's always geared towards what they could get. It will never flow from the love of God and out. So an unbeliever can never fulfill this command. This command is a tutor. It's to show you that you can't love the way God loves the way that he has commanded his people to love. It's to be a mirror that shows your heart is loveless that you might flee to the lovely one, the Lord Jesus Christ, who did love that way and through him can produce this kind of love. So when did we learn? When were we enabled? Look with me in verse 22. We were enabled, Peter says, since you have an obedience to the truth, in verse 22, you have purified your souls. 
And so we spent time seeing that, that that is when you were converted. That was you obeyed the truth of the gospel to repent and believe. And when you believed, you purified your souls. And so we saw love is impossible in your own strength, yet it is inevitable in your new birth. It will and must flow in the believer's life. So I said you can learn doctrine and you can study it for many of the wrong reasons. There are probably some sitting here this morning who study it for the wrong reason. It's easy to say, I just want to get smarter. I want to win debates. I love academic prowess. I study for all the wrong reasons. You can be moral for many motives other than the gospel. It's it's the way my family lived. It's tradition. It's how I get accepted. It's how I get people to like me. You can have an absolute wrong motive why you seek to be moral and live, and you can say even unto God, and it'd be a wrong motive. The kind of love that Peter's talking about is the best acid test to say, have I been born again by the gospel of Jesus Christ? We, We said Peter could have picked a lot of different things. He could have said, do you love God? And, and where he's coming is, this is the essence, you can't love others unless you love God. And so he could boil everything down to one test. Here is how I know if I've been born again. And there, there's a lot of other things that the Bible describes that, to help you know, but here is the acid test. Do I have love for the brethren? So when were you enabled to love like this? When you were born again, when you were saved. Second question, who are we to love then? Peter says you're to have a sincere love of the brethren. He says you're to fervently love one another. This is the body of Christ. This is your fellow believers. So God saved you. You are born again, and he gave you a new love within, and then he gave you a new family to love a new family, the body of Christ, my brothers and sisters. I have a new place to express this agape that God has put within me, the family of God that you were adopted into. All believers are brought into this new family, and we have new affections with new ability to love like no other. And I pray that you're getting this. I pray as as I keep looking at this gospel, there's just this rising joy that I have in the body of Christ and love and desire to just lay my life down for them. And I I pray that every one of you are testifying to the same thing, that these truths that we saw in 1 Peter 1, I, I just want to express love to God and love to others. Third question, well, how then are we to love? And Peter says we're to have a kind of a Philadelphos Love for the brethren. We're to, we're to have a love, this brotherly love for each other. There's an affection that goes back and forth. But the command, the imperative is that you're to have agape for each other. And we looked a lot at what agape was, and that's, that's God's love. That is a love that can only flow from the spirit of love. God is love. He's the essence of where this will ever come from and where this will ever flow. But if I had to describe it, it's, it's someone who just looks at an object And all I want to do is give myself to better that object, and it doesn't matter what I get out of it. It's not about me. It's not what I can get. I love because he first loved me, and I just want to give myself to that object to better them at any cost, any gift that I have. I want to give to them to better, to love, to care for them. That's the essence of agape. It's a sincere love, Peter said, and a a pokriton, where we get the word hypocrite. So it's not fake. This, we got to get past what the world can do. The best they can do is be hypocrites. They can show an external love and never have it on the inside, and we're not to have that kind of love. We have a love that is real, and it is genuine. Peter says it's from the heart. It flows from our very corner, the very mission control center of who we are. It comes from the heart, and we're to do it, he said, fervently. That that word, uh, ectones, it was used to speak of a horse or a runner straining every spiritual muscle as they're running, as they're racing. It's a stretching kind of love. It means to stretch a muscle to its maximum limit, to go all out, to reach the limit of love. It's, It's like a good Samaritan. It's like forgiving 70 times 7. It's like 1 Corinthians 13. It is then a sacrificial, stretching, denying kind of love. 
That's how we are to love children of God. My fourth question is then why are we to love like this? And we'll look at verse 23. For you have been born again. You've been born again. We have been born again. And what he's saying then is this is our new nature. It'd be like commanding us when we uh, were born into this world, love yourself selfishly. That, that's probably the easiest thing we could ever do as unbelievers. Here, I command you, love yourself selfishly. That's easy. That's all I do. It's natural. It comes out of me. I don't even have to work at it. And so now you're born again. Love supernaturally. This is your nature. This is the new birth within you. This is what God has put within you now. The new birth is I want you to consider then what has happened at this new birth. Peter already said it gave you faith. It gave you faith in Jesus Christ. It gave you a hope in what is coming. And now it's given you a love. Faith, hope, and love is what Peter has addressed. We've been brought into the greatest, highest, most ultimate love ever known in the history of the world. The love of God, a love that is eternal, a love that Peter said in verse 2, it started in eternity past. God set his love on you before he even created the world. He said he chose us and he foreknew us. He set love upon us. And he says this love continues all the way into eternity, that you're going to be brought into your inheritance. It's imperishable, undefiled. It will never fade away. This is the most amazing love, God's love. Eternal, beautiful, drawing, saving love. You just can't measure it. Get out a ruler. There's no height, depth, breadth, or length. You cannot measure this love. And that love takes up your heart. By faith, it produces hope. And it gives birth to a heart that loves. And the question is why? And it's very simple what we've been studying because he first loved us. Don't ever start trying to love and, and hope that you can get God to love you. This is, he first loved us and I can never get over the love of God. I can't get past the cross. And because of that love, I'm full now. And for the first time, I don't have to use people. I can actually now just give myself to others in love. Where when I was an unbeliever, I used everybody. Everything I did was for me to feel better about myself, to have God feel better about me. Now, for the first time, we can love because he first loved us. The more we grow in studying this word and seeing the depth of how he loved us, the more we will grow up into our salvation, which we will look at after the Reformation. Uh, it says that you, you've grow, grow in respect to salvation. You will grow in your ability by God's spirit to love. You're going to grow up into this. You're going to keep maturing, but shoot at the right thing. I, I want to grow in the fulfillment of the whole law to love. And I just want to read you a couple verses, and then we'll dig in to what's before us. Listen to 1 John 3.10. By this, children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Do you realize it's obvious who's a child of the devil and who's a child of God? Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. If you don't practice righteousness and love your brother, you're not of God. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain who was of the evil one. He slew his brother. And for that reason, what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not marvel, brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we passed out of death into life. We know we've been born again because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know no murderer, murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Well, we know love by this. How? That he laid down his life for us because he first loved us. Therefore, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and beholds his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We shall know by this that we are of the truth and we shall assure our hearts before him as we love. And in the next chapter, 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. If you've been born of God, you will love and you will know God. So I want to make clear a few things then as we move this morning about the new birth. So in verse 3, we kind of looked at a little bit that you were born again 
to a living hope. And I just want to share a few more thoughts. This might be a lot of review, but I, I think it's important that we understand what it means to be born again. And the reason I feel that is it, it seems to be being lost in the church of God. First, that being born again, it, it's central. It's central. Just by way of observation as you read this, Peter just drops it in so casually, for you've been born again, not of seed, and he just keeps moving, and he doesn't even explain what it means to be born again. For, for you've been born again, and there's no explanation to it. It doesn't seem like something that the saints of God were confused about when he was writing this letter. They, they knew about the new birth. It's absolutely central to the Christian faith. And today, I really, it's become an option. Today, it's, it's a brand of Christianity. You're, you're, you're one of those. You're a born-again Christian. I like the Christians. I don't like born-again Christians. What does that mean? It, you're, you're, it's a type of Christianity. And if someone calls you a born-again Christian, it means you're obnoxious, narrow, and bigoted. You ram your religion down people's throats, and you're unloving, and you don't coexist. Today, being born again is just a type of Christianity. And Jesus said, unless you are born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. You can't even enter into it. So unless the new birth takes place, you can't get into the kingdom of God. The way you enter the kingdom of God is the new birth. That's how you are brought into this whole new realm of the spiritual realm of Jesus Christ ruling and reigning as the king in the new kingdom. So you can't even see it. And you can't enter it unless you're born again. So do you hear this? It's not a type of Christianity. This is what it means to be a Christian. A, a born-again Christian is redundant, okay? When you're born again, you are a Christian. And so I want to make sure we get that. And, and the acid test then of being born again is what? Fervent love uh, in verse 22 for the brethren from the heart. And so this can't be a list of rules that you work at. This is a new life with new affections springing from the reality that He has loved me and now let me love others. My life for yours. A community of people like this is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I'm telling you, it will change the world. It did in Acts 2. And when this starts to flow from all of us, everybody wants to be a part of that. And to be a faithful witness then with love and to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth like we studied last week. So hear me clearly. The new birth is not just that your sins are forgiven, but it's God putting Himself, His very Spirit, within the soul of man. It is God joining us into a spiritual union to Jesus Christ like a vine and a branch. And now we have new life, we have new affections, and we have a new power to love. And that's why you must be born again. It's central to Christianity, and I want to make sure no one's in here just trying to clean yourself up. You must be born again, or you'll never enter into God's kingdom. I want you just to hear from the Word of God and let it testify to you. Listen to John 1.12. But as many as received Him, Jesus, to them He gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in His name, who were born not of blood nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So the ones who received Him are those who were born of God. You were born again, and you received Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things, what you were in Adam, passed away. Behold, new things have come. You're born again. There's newness. There's new life. In James 1.18, it says, in the exercise of His will, God's, He brought us forth, how? By the word of truth. We'll study that this morning. So that we might be, as it might be, the first fruits among His creatures. You were born again through the preaching of the word of truth. In 2 Peter 1.4, for by these He's granted to us His precious and magnificent promises in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature that you might have the very nature of God put within you. You are born again, and you house now the Spirit of God, and you are one with Jesus Christ. So our testimonies are about the new birth that's taken place within us through the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is central to Christianity. You must be born again. And unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom of God, 
and you'll never enter into it. This, this is the essence. You must be born again. Secondly, it's necessary. And I'm going to get that from the rest of our text, that Peter starts talking about seed, which is perishable and imperishable, and he's going to quote from Isaiah in verse 24 and part of 25. So Peter really likes this idea of imperishable and perishable. Go back to verse 4. You, you, you've obtained an inheritance, which is what? It's imperishable. It, it won't fade away. It can't be destroyed. Moth and rust can't t- get at it. So you, you have an inheritance. I love it. It's imperishable. Then in 1 Peter 3, 4, talking about a godly woman trying to win her disobedient husband without a word, he says, let it be the imperishable qualities of a godly woman, these qualities that will never fade away. They're imperishable. In uh, verse 18 of chapter 1, uh, knowing that you were redeemed not with perishable things like silver or gold. It wasn't things that perished like silver and gold, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And now he's going to talk about uh, this birth taking place. And the seed that gave you birth, he says, is imperishable. And in the human realm, the seed that gave you birth is perishable. So the seed that God uses to get children, it's an imperishable seed. And as we progress, I'm going to show you what that seed is. It's the Word of God. But look at this idea that we were born of perishable seed. Look at verse 24 where he quotes Isaiah. All flesh is like grass, and all its glory is like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off. And so I want you just to listen to this and think about it, is that you're born of perishable seed. When you come into this world, you are a stillborn. And the cemetery testifies to this truth that we will all die. We're perishable. And for your homework this week, I want you to go walk through a cemetery It is just healthy to walk and even look at the dates of how old they were to see that young people die as well as old people die and to not lose sight that we are perishing. Let it it preach to you. You are mortal. You were born by a seed that is perishable. And so therefore, you will die. You will die. And so I think it's good to remind yourself of this very thing. You're perishable. And you can exercise till the cows come home and you're perishable. You can eat kale, apple cider vinegar, coconut oil, turmeric. You can eat paleo or ketogenic, acupuncture, massage, hyperbaric chambers, balance your pH because cancer can't grow in an alkaline environment. And the list goes on and on and on. You're going to die. You will die. I'm just, don't put your hope in those things. You were born with, an imper- with a perishable seed, and now, believer, you've been born again with an imperishable seed that will never die. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and life. If you die, he who believes in me, even if you die, you will live because you are born of an imperishable seed. And what is more, Peter says, you're just going to be like flowers. There, there were flowers, these gorgeous flowers that surrounded Palestine, and they flourished in the spring, and as we're moving into fall, the ones in my front house, you can just start seeing it. They start dwindling and drying up and they die. And so you can do amazing things in this life and you can make your body strong and body beautiful and just give it. You can become one of the great musicians of all time. And you can be the best businessman in our whole state and maybe the world. You can discover some amazing things. You can be an athlete who makes it to the Olympics and Paul says, what do they get? A perishable wreath. You can get riches untold, but at best, hear what Peter's saying, you're a flower. You're a flower. It's going to be a short-lived glory. And it will die and it will fade, and very few will ever remember you. At the grave, the prince and the pauper lay side by side. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. It's the same for a king and it's the same for a beggar. And the only way you're ever going to make a mark is to make a mark for God. And Peter says it's by this seed that is imperishable. And so I've said it so many times, there are two things on earth that are imperishable. The human soul and the word of God. To make your mark is to put his word into human souls. To see someone born again and to see others grow in a fervent agape love. 
a college group. I was, uh, I'd been gone for a month, and I came back on Friday, and it was so good to see them again. I love those guys so much. But I just always think back. There was like 75 kids sitting in here, and I just, it started with just a couple faithful ones. A couple faithful ones who kept giving up their Friday night, and they're just, it was almost dry. You know, just nothing was happening. And they just kept serving and loving and reaching out. And, and now there's all these kids, and a bunch of them are going into the ministry, and just all these different areas of how they're affecting their life. And all I could think of is just be faithful. Just be faithful and, and do the day to day things and put that imperishable word into souls. And, and just, man, walk in love. That's the only way to ever make a mark to give yourself to the commission that I charged you with last week in Acts 1. Work jobs, absolutely, but impact everybody in every way possible from this church to your neighbors to wherever you go. Put this word into eternal souls, amen? God very rarely uses the extraordinary means, just the ordinary. Uh, It's an extraordinary love, but just taking up a heart day by day affecting the lives that we come across, plotting and faithfulness. And I just don't lose this whole picture then. Your glory is fading. Your glory is fading. Young guys, your glory is going to fade. Have you come this morning? Maybe you can feel it. And you've come into church even saying, I can feel myself dying. What is the gospel? What matters? I'm about to go on vacation and I think half my vacation is going to different doctors and dentists and eyeglasses. The glory days of high school and your college sports, it vanishes. And I, I, I always love this time of year when they do the Hall of Fame game and all these old guys who can't even walk up on the stage are trying to keep the glory alive and no one cares anymore. Do you see? Just don't give yourself to the wrong things that perish and fade and don't matter. There's this eternal Word of God. This eternal Word of God. Give yourself. Don't waste your lives on the things that decay and die and lose its glory. You need to be born of imperishable seeds so that you will live forever with a glory that will never fade. And so I want you to hear something beautiful. Who did Jesus tell that he must be born again? There's only one time that he actually said you must be born again. Who was it? Do you remember? Good. Uh, Nicodemus. And and Nicodemus was what? He was a Pharisee. And he knew the Scriptures very well. He had memorized the Pentateuch then. He had given his life strenuously to keep the law of God, and he risked everything to come up to Jesus to ask him that question. And I think he was sincere. Some tried to trap Jesus. I think this man is sincere, not trying to trap him. And so what I want, the reason I'm bringing this up is that he had great biblical knowledge, and he had great morality. He was very religious. And Jesus looks at a great man like that, and he says, you must be born again. That's why they hated him. You're, not, you're, you're all on the same level. No, we're better than the sinners. We're up here. And Jesus looks at one of the highest ones up there, the most religious. You must be born again, or you're not going to enter into the kingdom of God. None of these things that you're doing, Nicodemus, will get you into the kingdom. These things that you're doing are perishable. They won't produce imperishable things. Nicodemus, you are in the same place as the prostitute Mary Magdalene. How could that be? How can this be? So please hear this. If you've come and you've wrecked your life up with sin and mistakes and consequences and maybe you're holding on, there's something there's, uh, in your past that you just can't get over. And I just want you to hear then, you're not behind the moral, squeaky, clean, religious guy sitting next to you. You you both must be born again with imperishable seed. You both need a gospel implanted into your hearts that you believe and you receive the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't come for the righteous, I came for sinners. It's the sick, not the healthy, who need a doctor. And so let that encourage your heart this morning that no matter what, what, whether you're in the slum or the sanctuary, that you must be born again, and it's a free offer to every type of person. And I want you to look at Jesus Christ. You can be born again, and you can be brought into this kingdom, and your record is not going get, to get in the way. Jesus' record is what will get you 
into the kingdom of heaven. So all seed is perishable and you will eventually die. You need a seed that will cause you to live forever. And my next question then is, is being born again, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a definite event. It's not something you work at for a long time and you get born again into the kingdom of God. It's, it's in the perfect tense. The perfect tense, again, last week, two weeks ago we talked about it. It's, it's an action that's completed with some existing, abiding results. And so there was a point where you were born again. And it has effects and it continues. I remember on February 10th, 1989, uh, I stood on an altar with Laura Greeby, who was going to be Laura Greeby Murphy, and we made vows before God and before witnesses, and we were married. It was done. And now there's been existing results of a growing love for 28 years, moving to 29. Okay, I like to test myself to make sure I don't forget those things. <laughs> completed. Existing results. You were born again, completed. Existing, abiding, continuing results from being born again. And Peter says, because of a fervent love that's growing and deepening within your life. So you need, uh, were you conscious of the moment that you were born again? As long as I've been a pastor, this stumbles more people, so I'm going to hit it again, is that some are and some are not. Some of you know exactly when it took place, and some of you know, man, it, it's a five-year span of what God was doing. I just kept sitting under the Word and hearing it, and one day, man, I just realized I believe this, and my life has been changed. And so I know even in my own life, I, I can't nail down the exact time, but I know the season, and God was working mightily to take a dead sinner and give him life, and yet there in 500 years ago, we have Martin Luther, and he knows the exact moment when God met him in that bell tower, and he was all together born again, boom, just like that. And so it's all different. God paints in different and beautiful colors. All who are Christians have been born again or you're not a Christian. There was an exact time, there was an exact moment when you went from death to life, when you came out of darkness into his marvelous light, and your, your comprehension of it can vary. But, but spiritually, it happened at a moment. So it must have happened. You've been born again. And so don't freak out if you can't remember the exact moment, but what you need to freak out about is if you have no love. Then you need to worry, has there been a birth, right? Right? Has there been a birth? I'll freak out if I just still love myself the same way. Then you got no hope. What I need to see is, have I been born again? And is there a fervent love that's growing and continuing uh, within me? Fourthly, being born again brings about a complete change. A complete change. Jesus says you cannot see the kingdom of God. So you can grow up in the church Kids, I want you to really hear this one. You can hear teaching since you were a little child, a little toddler. You could be the Awana champion, and you can actually win debates and not see the kingdom of God and not see the king because you don't have a life of love that flows from this gospel. You don't have a testimony that says, I was blind, but now I see. I was lost, but now I'm found. I'll never forget my first Christmas after being born again. I, I grew up in a Catholic family, and I sang those carols every Christmas, and I loved them. And all of a sudden, I was born again, and I sat there in this little Baptist church singing them, and suddenly tears started flowing down my face of, hark the herald angels sing, <laughs> glory to the newborn king, uh, God and sinners reconciled. And suddenly, this gave life, and new birth, and I'm just like, this is amazing what these songs are about. I can't all the way explain it, but once I loved only myself, and I, I used everyone. I walked in a room, and all I could think about is how they would accept me, and who could I get to accept me, and now my heart has been taken over by the love of Christ, and now from the heart, without hypocrisy, we can fervently love the brethren. This seed will grow up, and, and in Philippians, Paul says it will get more discerning. You're going to learn how to love better. It's going to get deeper, and so we are going to journey and grow in this. So just don't 
fall apart if it's not perfect. It's, it's the direction, not the perfection. I wish it was deeper and more profound in my own life. But it, it, its existence is the proof that you have been born from above. You have a spiritual life now that loves God and therefore it loves others. And some of you this morning, two weeks ago when I preached this command, you went out and you tried to love more, didn't you? And the reality is what you discovered is that your heart is loveless. And you went out, man, I got to work on this. I got I to manufacture love. And what you need this morning is Christ. Let the command to love like this tutor you to Jesus Christ this morning. I have a loveless heart, and I, I, I am the Awana champion, and I've memorized all the ABC, the Gospels, accept, believe, and confess, but I have never been born again, and I've got a loveless heart. And so instead of going out and trying to love better, you need to flee to the one who loved perfectly to the one who hung on a cross in your place. You need to flee with your loveless heart and your inability and your broken bootstraps from trying to pull them up, and you need to flee to that lovely one this morning. Let the birth take place. And so the question is, how? How does this birth take place? And I want you to hear, it's, it's a supernatural event. Peter tells us it's imperishable seed. The new birth is God's work. His Spirit does it. Jesus said it blows wherever it wishes. His Spirit will just come, and this morning it could blow through here, and someone could be born again who's been trying to love in their own strength and change and get God to love them. You could be born again. The Spirit could just blow through. But I'm telling you, the Spirit uses means. He doesn't just blow through and everyone be like, I've been born again. And everyone falls over like the blessings in some of those areas. So it's, it's not that. He does it through the word. The, he says, look what he says uh, in verse 25, the living and abiding word of God. Uh, verse 23, the living and enduring word of God. So you were born, this, this word for birth, it, it's planting a seed. And it, it's an imperishable seed that's planted. And so praise God for his truth, his truth. It's a living word. And I, I watched it this week. I got to see it again and again in some marriages and, and, and someone who just was trying to love in his own strength. And this word comes and it gives life. It rips it open and it shows them their need of a savior. Praise God for this word. It's abiding. It lasts. It doesn't change. It's a truth that stands forever. What is the truth? What is the truth in our context? The truth in verse uh, 25, this is the word which was preached to you. This is the word of grace. This is the word of the gospel. Jesus Christ redeemed with his precious blood that we saw in the last few verses. That message of Jesus Christ crucified in your place. This word goes out. The Spirit attends His word. And in verse 2 of chapter 1, the chosen, the Spirit takes that word and He implants it in their heart. Boom. It's a seed with an egg. I'm going to call the egg the human heart. And the seed and the egg meet. And there's conception and it gives birth. And a child of love comes out. In Romans 10, Paul said, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. It's this gospel. It's this message. We preach it. We share it. We proclaim it everywhere we can. That's the seed. And we pray that the Spirit will come and open that heart and let the seed in that heart have conception. And so the way he causes you to be born again is not just from heaven with a spirit blowing through a room. It's the spirit blowing through with the word of God being preached and sown in the hearts. The seed of the gospel gives birth to that which will live eternally with God in a love relationship with all the redeemed from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And so I love the hymn of the Reformation that Luther wrote, that word above all earthly powers, it, it abideth. It, it's above all earthly powers, it abides. The body they may kill, but God's truth abideth still. All, all other books become obsolete. 
All, all of my textbooks from accounting, they don't even use them anymore. Your medical books, your engineering books, everything is going to become obsolete. More technology, more truth comes and it disappears. But we come to this word 2,000 years, 5,000 years later, and the word of God and the gospel, it abides for all of eternity. It's not perishable. It'll never change. It will not need to be added to or deleted. Hear that word this morning that God saves through His Son. That is a truth forever that will never change. That perishable seed, Jesus Christ came and lived the life that you should have. And the consequences for your sin, your lovelessness, He died on a cross because the soul that sins must die. That's eternal. And that will last and live forever. And it gives birth to something that will live with God forever. And so I pray that we will hand the baton of this truth to the next generation. We all have a responsibility in this. This truth abides forever, so we are to pass it on to the next generation. And so I thank God for 19 years, Steve and Kim Murphy have labored to train our little ones in this imperishable seed. And I thank all the people who have helped them and worked for them over those 19 years. And I thank Brian Rutland For 19 years, he has opened that word of God and preached it and taught it to the junior high and high school. And I thank you for all who have helped him in serving. Sowing this imperishable seed into souls that will live forever. And all the teachers who have taught us in Sunday school so that we could hand off a pure, unadulterated gospel. I want us to keep learning this sweet gospel from every angle, knowing it, understanding it, and then let's hand it off this word that lasts forever to the next generation. I told you before the joy when my little millennials stand in this pulpit with suits and ties and labor in the word of God to just teach the word gives me goosebumps every time. (laughs) Yeah. This Bible is the word above all earthly powers. And it's being silenced in our land and in our churches. And it's beginning to take second place. And as a result, the church is becoming biblically illiterate. And we've lost confidence in His Word that there's techniques and other things you have to do. And there's a great confusion in regards to the faith. And we've lost confidence in the book. But I die on the hill that when this Bible is clearly taught, the voice of God is clearly heard. Will you help me pass on the baton? Praise God for the word that abides forever. Sow it everywhere you can. Give your lives to this. Get it in your children. Dads, if, if, if your dads, man, sow that constantly into those children. Moms, if you're single, moms, sow it constantly. If you need help, ask. We will get help however you want, but sow, sow, sow the eternal word. I don't want to teach my kids how to give their lives to the things that are going to be like a little flower that's going to fade and die and go away. Make your main thing to sow the imperishable word into everyone that you know. Families, kids, friends, neighbors, people in this church, I love that almost every one of these college kids now have a mentor. People are getting in and they're pouring their lives into one another. Keep doing it. Don't rest. This word above all earthly powers, it abides. Give your lives to that. Amen? That's the seed that God used to cause us to be born again. And we heard this gospel and we saw glory in the face of Jesus Christ. And we loved it and we treasured it and we believed it. And we came forth, and now there's a seed within us that will cause us to fervently love God and fervently love one another. That's the only way we know that we've been born from above. And so my prayer, uh, even in this class that we're teaching, that we will learn how to walk by the Spirit and confession of sin, how to commune with God, and by His power become people who love fervently, from the heart without hypocrisy and stretching. But I do, some of you who, you've spent your whole life in the church and the, the bottom line is you're loveless. You, you don't love anyone but yourself. That isn't what this seed produces. And so I'm gonna ask you this morning that you would come to Jesus Christ. You would let it tutor you. All you've done is morally cleaned up the outside and that new seed has never taken place in your heart. 
There's a Savior who who says, come to me. Because you're weary and heavy laden trying to love and you can't. And I will give you rest for your souls. I'll give you salvation. I'll give you this new heart. If, If you need that this morning, I want you to come see me afterwards. I would love to spend time with you. So in closing, I just... First Peter is, it's been a life changer for me. It's an amazing chapter. And what I want to do as we close is I want to put it back in its context because that's really important. And so remember the context is, is that Nero is persecuting the church greatly. He's going to be crucifying Christians. He was taking them and pinning them up on a pole at his parties and throwing uh, tar all over them and pitch, and he would light them, and they would be the lights at the party. They would be burning, and it was awful, the persecution that came under this man. And so Peter now has been called to, to lead the church and help them in such a season. So they, it's, it's coming on them, but the persecution is beginning and already mounting. And Peter's teaching them how to navigate this season that they're in, and it's just going to intensify greatly very shortly. And so they need to be able to go into the furnace that is upon them and is going to come upon them, and they need to go in and not be destroyed. You can't be charred and and destroyed in the trials that are going to be put upon you. They're coming. And so you need to go into the fire and come out as gold. You need a faith that we saw in verse 5 and 4 that is refined when it goes in the furnace. So when I go into trial, I don't chuck my faith. I don't hate God. I go in and the impurities of my faith boil off. So I have this purified faith that loves God and trusts Him and believes in Him. And he says this faith produces hope and, and peace and glory. And so I need to take the truths of First Peter and not academically just know them I, I got to get to where I'm going to go in the furnace, and, and it's starting in America. It's increasing, and I want us to be able to go into this furnace and come out as purified gold. And that key verse, that word in verse 6, do you remember? If necessary, God puts you into trials, and it's not if you think it's necessary. It's if God thinks it's necessary, and it's how long He wants to keep you in. Sometimes He'll bring you out. Sometimes He'll deliver you, but even if He doesn't, I'm going to praise him and trust him and love him, and, and he's enough. And I just, I just want you, God, a faith that's refined to say God is all, Jesus is all. Even if you're the light at Nero's party, God is sufficient and your hope is untouched. And if you are crucified upside down as Peter was, you walk into it entrusting your soul to a faithful creator and doing what is right. I read this week about a man who I think he was real close with Wesley, and he was dying, and, and as he started getting delirious, he couldn't read his Bible anymore, and he was just a man of God, and that, he, he'd given himself to that word, and, and he just put it on his chest, and he laid there just patting it. He could no longer un- read it, but he knew it was his, his promises and his bedrock, and he just died patting his Bible, trusting and believing it as he entered through the shadow of the valley into the presence of of Christ. And so I know many of you have been suffering very deep lately. The trials have been hard. I, I had one of the girls in my college and career group almost die two weeks ago with her lungs shutting down and another one who's just battling some physical issues. And just in, in the body, there's been so many trials and it, it's getting harder. And I wanted to make my application this morning to encourage you and help you as we put it back into Peter. And I I want to do it by way of a song. And so I don't want you to get nervous. I'm not the one who's going to sing it or anything like that. But I asked my dear wife and some of my boys if they would come make my application of this chapter. It's a song that has just taken up my heart. And I want you to sit and listen and worship. Maybe just close your eyes even and just worship God. And then the next six weeks, while we're going over the Reformation, I want you to work on maybe memorizing this first chapter of Peter. And then what I've been doing, I want you just to pray it over in your quiet time and just take these truths and be praying, God, let me fix everything on the hope that's coming that I've been born again to. And just pray them into your life, the holiness we've looked at and the love. And and just spend these next six weeks really digging in. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to pray. And if you guys just want to come on up, while I'm praying, and then we'll have our our application together.
Father, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you that it's an imperishable seed. I thank you that it, it's unchanging. Lord, we possess your truth, the truth manifested in 66 books of our God who is a saving God. God, we love what we see in this Bible. And I love that you, you caused us to be born again by the truth of, of a God who would leave heaven and come to this earth and take on the form of a servant, even go to the point of death on a cross. And God, I pray that love would fill every mind and heart in this room, that everyone would look away from their own merit, their own strength, their own ability to love, and they would die at the foot of Jesus Christ. The only one who ever could love the way you required was the Son of God. And I thank you that he came and gave us a righteousness so that we could now stand in your presence blameless with great joy. I thank you that we can be wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ and be accepted before the Father, the Godhead. Lord, we thank you for this. And I thank you that uh, this word above all earthly powers, Lord, that it, it possesses the only remedy for man. And so, Lord, help us to pass it on. Help us to share it and to preach it and to teach it and to take it into the ends of the earth. God, let us not give ourselves to the things that are going to die, the glory that's going to fade. Don't let those be the passions of our life. God, let this be the chief supreme passion of all, that everything we do in this life, even the gifts and the things that you've given us and the jobs and the accomplishments, that they are all pointing to one thing, the glory of Almighty God in the face of Jesus Christ. So I pray now, Lord, that you will apply this word to a suffering church and that our hearts will be brought back again, that you're enough. And if you leave us in the fire, God, we love you. And if you take us out, we love you. We have been born again, and we just love you, and we trust you. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray these things. Amen. They say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. And right now, right now I'm losing back. Day after day, night after night, reminding the broken it'll be alright. But right now, Oh, right now I just can't It's easy to sing But there's nothing to bring me down What will I say When I'm held to the flame Like I am right now I know you're able And I know you can Save through the fire with your mighty hand but even if you don't My hope is you alone They say it only takes a little faith Whoa.
on one knee Cause I know you're able And I know you can I know you're able I know you can Say through the fire With your mighty hand Believe and if you don't My hope is you Father, it is well with my soul. I thank you for what we've learned in 1 Peter. God, and I pray for everyone suffering in this room. God, we love them deeply, and you love them more than we ever could. And I thank you that you're fashioning and, and protecting them by refining a faith that will bring them to the very last day for this reward that's above every reward we could hope, think, or imagine. And so, God, thank you that you purify faith. Thank you that you put us in trials and you leave us for exactly how long we should be in them. God, our faith is in you. And I pray, revive every, every heart here this morning, or no matter what place they're in, that you would lift that again and you would give them great hope of a God who, who is protecting them, who's bringing them safely to glory through that instrument of faith and that you're purifying it. God, I thank you for it. We praise you. We thank you for these last months and the way you've met us. You've blessed us in this word, and we give you all the glory, praise, and honor. Thank you for the indescribable gift of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.